Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the governor vetoes five bills as a pretty clear indication that her bill signing moratorium is still very much in effect. This is the battle over Medicaid expansion now includes investigations into threats made to lawmakers who support the governor's plan. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals strikes down an Arizona abortion law. Those stories and more next on the Journalists Roundtable. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining me tonight are Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times. After vowing not to sign any bills until the legislature made significant progress on Medicaid expansion and the budget, the governor proved her point this week with her veto pen, and we will get to that in just a second. But first, we've got to get to Sheriff Joe Arpaio just coming in, uh, the decision uh, regarding his discrimination case, a civil case here. What's going on? A federal court judge ruled um, after a eight months of deliberation, after a week-long trial uh, back last year, that um, Arpaio's office did racially profile drivers when they made stops and uh, discriminating against Latino drivers and said, stop it. He's going to issue an injunction to, to prevent that from happening in the future. A lot of this is based on those suppression sweeps that we all read about. I mean, you couldn't help but reading about it because he was busy putting out press releases. And he'd go into areas where, as the judge said, Latinos tended to gather. You didn't see a lot of suppression sweeps in Paradise Valley, for example. And the judge said that what they did is they did, the, the suppression sweeps were pretexts for stopping vehicles on equipment violations, things they never stopped vehicles for. And that if somebody in the vehicle were Latino, they held them longer than just writing up the ticket. And that they were using mm -hmm. that as a way of seeing if they could find illegal immigrants. And he said, you cannot do that. He said, theoretically, that the sheriff's department said, well, we don't use racial profiling, but in fact, the actual practices of the department were to use race as a factor in determining when to question people. And he said, you cannot do that. And the judge basically said, you cannot do that. Stop doing that. Yeah, so uh, the, the judge agreed with, uh, with what the plaintiffs have been seeking, which is an injunction against this practice. It's basically, you can't stop a vehicle based on the race or ancestry of those inside. You can't uh, start questioning people about their immigration status if your sole basis is their race or ancestry. And you can't um, you know, hold people for a long time um, also because of race or, an or ancestry, because that's a violation of, of people's support amendment rights. And, of course, the sheriff, I talked to him this afternoon, he said, well, we don't profile and uh, you know, we'll be appealing this, which is sort of fascinating since the ruling provides no financial relief. There is no sanction, no criminal penalty. It's simply an order, don't profile, and yet he wants to appeal well, that to the Ninth Circuit. But, but why wouldn't you? Why would you want that on your record, especially when we still have outstanding this Department of Justice investigation into the practices of his office? I mean, why, why would you want to acknowledge a, a major blemish like that on your record? Well, but you're assuming that anything is, A, going to keep him from getting reelected, and B, the DOJ case has to stand on its own. And, and while certainly this provides some fodder for the Department mm. of Justice, I'm not sure that they can use what Judge Snow found as a basis for, for bringing you know, any sort of criminal charge. And we're not sure yet as to how much fodder how much for the files there for the Department of Justice investigation or where this would lead regarding other civil cases that may come down the pike against the Sheriff's Department. Uh, again, this is just coming in, so we'll get a chance to read over this. How many pages was it? 140 pages. 140 pages. 140 pages. Well, we'll all have a nice holiday weekend of yes. reading for that. <laughs> um, let's get back now to what's happening at the state capitol. The governor vetoes five bills, I guess, she certainly understands what moratorium means. She does, and she wants to make sure that the legislature does. Um, if you recall, about two weeks ago, the governor said, no more, I'm not taking action on any more bills until you get working and you show me uh, some progress on Medicaid and the state budget. Those two issues, of course, are tied, uh, tied together. So they pretty much stopped sending her bills. But this week, a couple of the Senate bills did get um, found, found their way up to the governor's office, and she got out her veto stamp and... and Send them off to the scrap heap. And of course, now we're into a definitional question. As Mary Jo pointed out, the word that came down is I want progress or substantial progress. Well, as we know, as we talked about last week, the Senate did approve A, a budget, mm -hmm. and B, her Medicaid plan. It was over the sort of cold, dead body of Senate President Andy Biggs. But he figured, we've done our bit. So I thought that whatever moratorium had occurred was over. In her veto message, 
she said she doesn't, it, she didn't use the word substantial progress anymore, she wants resolution, which of course Biggs is saying, yeah. does that yeah. mean my way or the highway? Is it have to be resolved the governor's way? Uh, it, precisely, that, those were the points raised by Senate President Andy Biggs when I talked to him um, the day that they sent out uh, Senate bills to the governor. I said, so why are you doing this one? And he said, well, first of all, the governor has not called me and said, stop sending bills. And second of all, she said substantial progress. Well, if she's seeking that we pass a budget plan, meaning we, the House and the Senate, complete a budget proposal with Medicaid expansion, well, that's not substantial progress. That's completion of you know, what, what she's seeking. So, but you know, what happened, if I'm not mistaken, was that immediately after the Senate passed the budget, in, which included the Medicaid proposal, the governor's office said, just passage of this budget by one body does not constitute or does not satisfy uh, her requirement. Or but, her but they said that to us, and that's the issue. I mean, you know, I guess the question is, if Matt Benson tells me what the governor wants, is that the same as telling but, Andy Biggs? But he, he's a, if, if, if you're President Biggs, don't you find out first, or do you want to go ahead and send? And, and what was sent over there, by the way? Was there a message in what was sent over there? Well, um, I think particularly with the Religious Freedom Bill um, that was promoted by the Center for Arizona Policy, uh, passed the Senate on Wednesday, I believe, and went up. Um, that's something that you would expect the governor to sign, and by vetoing it, she sort of you know, um, vetoes Kathy Harrod, who's been very influential at the legislature and, and with whom the governor is usually in sync with. So there is a bit of a message. But, but, the, I, well, but yeah. the interesting thing about this one is th this is not the first time that the governor has said, don't send me bills. And when they sent yes. her bills, she'd veto those bills. I mean, we've seen this one for the last... How, well, however many well, years has she been in office? This is sounding a lot like 2009, and as if, uh, many people might recall that back then, the new governor, Brewer, wanted the state budget. The legislature passed it. They weren't sending it up to her because um, they knew that she thought it stunk and that she would veto it and send them back to work right away, and they didn't want that to happen. So they held on to the budget. She went to the Supreme Court, got a ruling, you know, and, 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 and frankly, it does look like the actions of the House, which in deference to Brewer has sat on 17 bills that are otherwise ready to go, they, that they're violating that court well, order. Well, I was going to say, whatever happened to that court order? It's, I mean, it's I still there. Was... Well, here, here's the part of the problem. This was not, this was less a formal ruling than an order, because the judges basically set a plague on both your houses because they faulted the legislature. Uh, for, for not sending it, but they also said, well, the budget bills weren't exactly the way they were supposed to be and, the, and the, the, the reconciliation bills. But it's very clear, if you look at what Ruth McGregor wrote, and she was the Chief Justice, she said, you can basically hold it for, for normal processing ministerial actions. Anything else is, in fact, unconstitutional. Now, here's the problem. Who has the right to sue? The governor? The legislature? Luigi, do you have the right to sue? Well, uh, it wasn't sent, and that's the problem right. with, constant, oh, with with political questions like this one, right? I mean, there's really no remedy at the end of the day. I mean, you can't have. I mean, if, even if somebody sues, so what? You go to court, and the court said you're wrong, and then what happens next? But I guess what the court said is that um, if the bill is final, read, I mean, to say it's voted on and passed by the two chambers, you can't you can't hold on to it beyond ministerial procedures, you know, time needed for that. But there is a mechanism, a way for the House and the Senate to actually sit on bills. You can stop a bill from getting a final reading. That way, even if a bill has all the supporting needs, you can sit on it and you don't violate the... Understood. Right. But they didn't do that. That's, That's true. the point. That's true. They, they said, you know, the House Bill 2389 has been his final approval by a vote of such and such. And they just didn't say the magic words and transmit the bill to the governor. Well, so when the governor, I think she wrote among the many things she wrote in her. And by the way, uh, she just said nothing about the bills in these no, rejections. It was, no. it was all about, I, I told you not to do this. Right. So, yeah, so, you know, for all this sort of inside baseball and who can send and who can't and time frames, the larger issue here is the governor wants, she's like, wrap it up, guys. It's been 130 days into the legislative session, and there are many, many lawmakers who agree with her. But, you know, but Medicaid is stuck in the House along with the budget, and until they get some kind of, they, they get some kind of movement there, which very likely could send everything back to the Senate, you know, and it, there has to be some kind of compromise. I mean, she's looking ahead and saying, there's, and there's a lot what's, that's, what's, there's a lot of time left to, uh, on the clock, it would appear. And what really struck me about those vetoes 
uh, is the fact that she was very candid about what she wanted. And whereas before, she would use a, a you know she would find a, a policy reason for rejecting a exactly. bill. Exactly. Not, not even, they well, didn't even the, bother this time. And quote the quote how I must demonstrate my moratorium is no idle threat. Yeah. I mean, okay, I think she's demonstrated that. Are are they just going to keep throwing stuff over there and, and say here you go? Well, uh, I don't think so. I think, see, the problem is that this late in the session, resurrecting bills is very difficult. You either have to find an existing bill to amend it onto or get special permission to start a new bill from scratch. So I don't think, I think that Andy proved his point. She proved her point. Okay, now we come down to the question of, let's assume that the House version of Medicaid is the Andy Biggs ver Andy Tobin version with the public vote that the governor doesn't want sends it back to the Senate? Okay, Senate. For, let's say they get the votes. They've resolved the Medicaid issue, but not the way the governor wants it. Does that mean the moratorium stays in place? Does she keep them here until she holds a breath and turns blue? What is happening with with the House and with the Medicaid expansion and with uh, the Speaker's efforts to go ahead and get this referred? What, what's going on there? What's the latest? Well, the, the, the Speaker has a, a, a proposal to punt this question to voters. Right now, he is working the votes. He's, he's trying to find the votes. He's talking to groups who are supporting the governor's plan and trying to persuade them to, to support his proposal. What we've heard so far is that there's not the votes for his proposal to get out of his chamber. And even if it did, we've spoken with a whole number of conservative Republicans in the Senate who said, we don't want to send this question to voters. This is our responsibility. We should decide this one, not ask the voters to do that for us. But okay. now we're into, you know, as we've talked about here, do you need to send it to the voters because otherwise is this a tax? If it's a tax, it needs a two-thirds vote. It didn't get a two-thirds vote. The other problem is if it gets out in the form that the governor wants, it takes only like 80,000 valid signatures to refer the measure to the ballot, which essentially puts the whole thing off until 2014. And so there, there's many permutations of where this could go. Compare what's happening in the House now with what happened in the Senate. I mean, is, are, are, is the Speaker keeping his uh, troops in line and there's any, any mutinies happening there? Or? No, they're not mutinies. Um, the, the House, um, I don't think there's any talk of rolling the Speaker or trying to, to get a new one in there. It's, it's just a different dynamic. The, the divisions in the Senate were apparent really from even last year before, before the election with a mm -hmm. lot of these members. And those divisions have been obvious and fairly deep. The, the House is not divided in that way. It's just that it's a, it is a big caucus. It's 36 Republicans. And, you know, Tobin says that he needs half of the caucus to go along with this before he's going to move it. And that's a big, big hurdle. But Heather Carter, who is carrying the bill for the governor there, says she can line up six or seven other Republicans, which if you add to the 24 Democrats, can re repeat what happened in the Senate. Now, as Mary Jo says, it's not going to be the same sort of, you know, you know we're, we're going to roll over you. But at a certain point, I think if the Speaker cannot line up the votes, he almost has to allow the other bill to come to the floor. What do we make of uh, Representative Kavanaugh uh, saying appropriations mm. not going to touch this? What, uh, what's the factor there? Appro uh, that's that's pretty important, isn't it? Or well, they're going to strip out he'll strip out Medicaid. He says, yes. you know, now it can be. Um, I suppose someone else could try to put it on, but th that would be very difficult to get it on in the um, in his committee. So you do it in the floor. That's what they did in the Senate. Mm. Medicaid was not part of the Senate budget bill when it came out of Senate appropriations. It, it yeah, got amended on the floor. To, yeah. and, and what would be interesting about that, if they, if they decided not to re essentially hear the Medicaid expansion proposal in the appropriations committee, or if there's going to be less discussion about that, it would be probably the biggest policy that we've seen in years, actually get out of the legislature without so much of a hearing in, in a committee. Um, we are hearing about, though, threats. What's going on here regarding lawmakers, Republican lawmakers, getting what sound to be pretty substantial threats. Well, what sort of, you know, took the, exposed all this was that Senator, uh, Representative Kate Brophy McGee stood up on the House floor yesterday and just, and talked about this, which she called the very obscene, angry phone call that had come in on her voicemail um, the, the night before. And it was unsettling. And she said, look, we shouldn't be talking this way. I shouldn't be afraid, you know, to come to work and, and do my job and take take the stands that I do. Uh, Brophy McGee supports Medicaid expansion and says that things like this actually just reinforce um, her her decision to, to vote for this when whenever that opportunity arises. And then other people start to chime in and say, yeah, well, we've gotten phone calls. You know, we're going to follow you. You know, we're going to chase you. We're going to chase you to the ends of the earth. And then there's emails coming from outside groups, um, you know, 
and the tenor of them, one was particularly bizarre because it cited the Second Amendment and a defense that someone could mount if they um, are charged with shooting someone. But we're talking about Medicaid, so that's that was that was very concerning to to a number of lawmakers. The you know emotions as we've seen on this whole <laughs> issue have run high, but it seems like the atmosphere has been particularly poisoned. And some of that goes back to A.J. LaFaro, who heads, heads the county Republican committee, starting off with his comment comparing the governor to Judas. He's <laughs> continuing to make comments as saying the Republicans who vote for this are political dead meat. And that stirs folks up. And so we're not so much having a discussion of the policy. We're having a discussion of Barack Obama. And if you support anything that Barack Obama wants, then you must be a disloyal Republican. But you know what? It sounds like that could be it. You want to put this thing on the ballot and you want to have uh, refer to the voters. Welcome to that kind of rhetoric and more if this becomes a statewide Correct. referendum. Understood. And that, I think that's part of the reason the governor doesn't want it on the ballot because it becomes, you know, think of the Koch brothers and the kind of money they could drop in here on just this issue to kill it. Yeah, I, I, how we made that point, I mean, assuming they get these signatures, for example, there's an effort to put this question on the ballot as a referendum, which they would only need about 86,400 signatures. Now, if about? they... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, they Sorry. Right. Yeah, three, they have three months to do it. But look, it's, I've, I've, I've talked to one Republican strategist who was actually supporting the expansion plan, and he said it's doable. If you have the money to do it, and if you're organized, especially if you have lots of money to do it, it's doable. It's a very high hurdle, but it's, it's doable. It's, no, it's not. I don't even think it's such a high hurdle. If you go out in the street right after the show's over and you have a petition and say, sign this to keep Obamacare from coming to Arizona, you'll get 80,000 signatures in two weeks. You will do that. There is no problem getting the signatures on this. We also had not only just emails and phone calls bizarre, of a bizarre and threatening nature coming in from the outside. There was a curious email from the inside, uh, a Republican lawmaker to a fellow Republican saying what? Well, this was Representative Bob Thorpe, um, who's a freshman Republican from Flagstaff. And he does seem to um, maybe not always think before he hits the send button on his email. He likes to, he likes to send emails and keep sending them, Representative Thorpe. Um, this was an email that he sent to his followers, folks that, that he communicates with. He copied, um, uh, on his email, he copied the names of six other um, GOP lawmakers in the House who support Medicaid expansion. It was sort of a way to say, and he urged these people to contact those six and you know, let them know that you know, they should vote against Medicaid expansion. Well, that gets out, you know, and this, so the, the speaker then has to sort of admonish Mr. Thorpe that you, know, you really shouldn't do that and you know, rally the troops against your own colleagues. So Thorpe apologizes in another email in, in which he adds on more <laughs> Republicans. He's got, I guess, he's got all these lists, and um, and then it came up in the floor discussion yesterday. And uh, Representative Brophy McGee, who was one of the people named in the email, she said, you know, it just would be nice if you thought a little more before sending. I mean, they don't see malice there, and he is, uh, he's a very polite, sort of nice guy when you talk to him. He's just, and he did apologize and said he screwed up and he meant he meant no um, bad but, intent. He just wanted them to vote no. Yeah, but, even, but the even, recipients of these emails are the ones who are probably behind some of the threats we're getting. They're saying, well, I, Bob Thorpe says I ought to do what I can to keep these people from voting for it. And here they are. And, yeah. and, and, and by the way, they now know that here they are. So yeah. that, that was the, putting them on. Yeah. So with the exception, Thorpe's emails are not going to be investigated. But um, mm. the, the Second Amendment, the one that references the Second Amendment and the harassing phone call to Representative Rofa McGee have been turned over to um, public safety and they'll be um, seeing what they can run down on those. Before we leave the Capitol, we had a, uh, a non-prayer <laughs> during the prayer and then a second prayer to repent against the non-prayer. Luigi, please. Yeah, it's a, it's a week of, of religion and faith, and, and the intersection of, of faith and politics. Very interesting to watch. So Juan Mendez, a freshman Democrat legislator from um, uh, Tempe, uh, prayed or gave a non-prayer, uh, uh, basically a secular humanist kind of a prayer. And, uh, and, you know, and even before that, he had asked people for solicitation about how he should go about this, this prayer. Um, let me start by saying that each session they begin, the House and the Senate begin with, with a prayer and they ask you know, a, a rotating cast of members to, to provide this, this prayer. And you know, we've seen Muslims, Jews, all kinds of religions go in there and pray. Well, Juan Mendez thought that you know, it's his time to, to pray a, 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 a secular prayer, a, a non-religious prayer. 
And, well, <laughs> you, you get all sorts of reactions uh, when you do something like that. And that's what we got. What, that's what we saw uh, this week. And that's what happened, of course, is, and he, he kind of made sure people knew what he was doing. He said, you know, normally you say, bow your head. Well, I'm going to urge you not to bow your head, but look around and be happy that we're all here. We're discussing public policy. Well, Representative Steve Smith, who is, um, you know, never one to avoid a controversy, decided the next day, after the regular prayer had been offered by Kelly Towns, and said, well, we need to make up for the non-prayer prayer by offering a second prayer because the Almighty will be really ticked off otherwise, and issued a prayer. And, of course, we all went up to him and said, well, okay, well, what defines a prayer? Do you need the name of God? You, something is a supplication. And, of course, his answer was sort of like the, the answer that the Supreme Court gave on obscenity. Yeah, well, you, you know, know it when, when you, you hear it. it. Yeah, or when you uh, hear. And that raised the question. The, the House rules say that the session begins with the, you know, essentially the, uh, the, the registration, prayer, pledge of allegiance. And his point was same as if pledge of allegiance. If you didn't give the pledge of allegiance, if you just said, I want to stand up and honor the people of the world, and you didn't give the pledge, you didn't give, you haven't followed the rules. He said it, a prayer requires the, the use of the Almighty. It was, it was an interesting yeah. side trip to all the other weird stuff going and on. And it sounds like everyone survived. Yes. We so, <laughs> so as we close out the pro, I do want to get to the Ninth Circuit's striking down this, yes. this Arizona abortion law. This is the one that bans abortions after 20 weeks, correct? Correct, after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Um, and this was a law passed last year, immediately, um, immediately appealed, and the lower court uh, upheld the Arizona law. So um, three doctors, the... ACLU and the Center for Reproductive Rights took it up to the Ninth Circuit and they ruled this week that the law is unconstitutional because you cannot put limits on abortion prior to uh, viability of the fetus and that is this this happens before the accepted viability date therefore it's unconstitutional. Now what's fascinating is Bill Montgomery who personally argued this said yes I understand what Roe versus Wade says and he says, I'm not really challenging Roe, sort of, but there's other things that should be taken into account. One is evidence of fetal pain. And interestingly enough, one of the, the, the judges who concurred said, well, if you're not allowed to interfere with a woman's rights and you're concerned about fetal pain, you could anesthetize the fetus. The other interesting one was this additional risk to women beyond the 20th week. And the, the judge said, uh, wait a second, people do all sorts of stupid things, they get all sorts of stupid surgery, we don't tell them they can't have that. And when you're talking about a woman's right, unless and until Roe versus Wade is overturned, absolute line is viability. I think the idea, it sounded to me like the idea, and we talked about it during the week with uh, Paul Bender, mm -hmm. that reasonable restrictions by states on abortion are okay. <laughs> this is not a reasonable restriction. The court, based, the Ninth Circuit, unanimously said this is a ban. Yes, and that's the linchpin of this whole decision. The court is saying this is not a restriction. You are not trying to regulate the procedure of abortion. You're trying to stop it from happening. If you are precluding women who are pregnant uh, for 20 weeks from getting an abortion, then you are stopping an abortion. And that right has been litigated, and the, the, uh, the longstanding court ruling or longstanding case law is that they have a right to do it. And, and that it, gets to Montgomery going to take the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, going right. to seek a petition for review. And I think he has to attack Roe versus Wade head on. Now, this is a very different court than 1973. Well, and, and the question is, will they take it? Well, uh, they take maybe 80, 90 cases a year out of, out of you know, thousands that are, that are sent to them. Uh, it's hard to say. It takes only four justices to, mm -hmm. to agree to a petition for cert. And viability, I think, is what Montgomery is really pressing on, this concept of viability. He, he, the, the argument is that medical technology has advanced a lot since Roe v. Wade, and we know a lot more now than what we did you know, four decades ago, and that, that data viability is, is moving backwards all the time, well, 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 in fact, earlier the, in time. According to the court opinion, the two sides did not, uh, uh, did not disagree about one thing, that at 20 weeks, that is not the point of viability. Mm -hmm. I mean, both sides agree that's not a viable uh, stage. And, and whether or not that viability, those standard changes. No, and, and it can change. Look, it was, you know, back in the days of, of Roe v. Wade, you know, it was considered 28 weeks, 26. We're now down to 23 to 24. But, but again, Montgomery's point is even if it's pre-viability, other issues like right. women's health 
and fetal pain allow us to create this quote unquote restriction. Okay, we got to stop it right there. Thanks so much for joining us. Monday on a special Memorial Day edition of Arizona Horizon, Secretary of State Ken Bennett tells us about a World War II memorial being built near the Capitol, and we'll hear about the National Memorial Cemetery of Arizona. That's Monday evening, 5 30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great holiday weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.